Welcome everybody, uh, my name is Colin. Uh, I work with APIs a lot, so I figured this would be a good chance to um, show you a really cool API and we're gonna mix and match some APIs uh, to make a bot. We're not gonna be creating bots to take over the world, we're gonna be making bots to take over Slack. Uh, so many people uh, use Slack today. Pretty good, about half. How many people don't know what Slack is? A couple, that's fine. So Slack is a real-time chat with your team or teams, and you'll see um, I have more Slack teams than I recommend having. Um, I hear there are new features coming that are, is gonna make that nicer for everybody though. Um, and obviously you can get it on all your mobile devices. Um, the really cool thing is that the APIs that the Slack clients that are shown here are using are also available to us as developers to be able to create uh, basically bots that uh, can interact with just you know one person or your whole team if, if needed. So we're going to build a couple bots today. I'm going to show you a couple bots. I'm going to talk about why you want to make bots, uh, and then hopefully um, most of this is going to be talking about how and then the, the exactly like what languages and things. We'll get into that a little bit. I'm going to be all my codes going to be in JavaScript, but these can be written in, in any language. Um, so this is the kind of the famous quote now about software is eating the world from Mark Andreessen, um, you know, referring to things like Uber and pretty much anything you can imagine now has an API. And those APIs, if you want to think about like, well, why would I want to make a bot? You can take any one of those APIs and marry it with Slack so that you can do those things without even leaving Slack. And that's really the goal there. Um, Slack believes in this so much that they have a fund for it, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, they have a, a VC fund to invest in companies that are building things on top of Slack. Um, I'm out of order on my slides here, so sorry about that. So these are some of the things that we can think of doing using APIs today. We can call an Uber, we can load test a website, um, have a conversation with an AI bot like the infamous Microsoft one we all saw this week. Um, book meetings, start Skype calls, um, do expense reporting. All of these are things that you can actually find in the Slack app store today. Um, so you can find out like what the wait time of an Uber is and then just tell it to, to order you one. Uh, and it's all in this conversational interface. So you would do like something like slash Uber, uh, call car, something like that. Um, load testing a website, this is one that we built um, in, into a bot that allows us to use, uh, we have a server running that's running something called Siege, and we can actually tell it how, we have what concurrency and how many users over what period of time we want to hit a certain endpoint or a certain website to, to simulate traffic. Um, and then you can do other things like deploy code, uh, get notifications and alerts from things like GitHub and Travis and all these other tools and things that we use as well. Uh, so again, there's a fund for investing in companies that are building on Slack. It's an $80 million fund. Slack really wants people to build things on top of Slack. Um, there are some companies that are building like these AI bots that are integrated with IBM Watson or there's a few other services like API.ai uh, and then others that are just integrations to existing services and APIs, things like Salesforce and FreshBooks, uh, again, really anything. Um, this is a topic that's fairly open-ended because a bot can be anything that you code, any kind of app. Um, you know, you'll have to make a call as to whether or not you're going to build your entire business on top of Slack, or you're going to build an app that has APIs that then you can expose to a bot or to slash commands and things like that. Um, so they have two main APIs and then a few other options. Um, for connecting to Slack, so they have a web API. The web API primarily is for accessing like users and organizations and the metadata around your Slack. Um, you wouldn't use this to make calls to each message and each channel that exists in Slack. So if you haven't used Slack, um, you basically have rooms, which are called channels. You have other people in your company in there. Uh, if you're not a part of the Dev Reno Slack, we have a Slack where a lot of us ask questions post jobs, post um, you know, any just interesting articles that we find. Um, the way that you get added to that is using that URL, slack.devreno.org or whatever. That's using the web API to automatically send you an invite. Um, but it's not gonna let you read Slack. Um, the real-time messaging API is the one that uses WebSockets. It's the same one that 
the clients are using and you also can use it to then listen in on the stream of conversations uh, as well as all the other events. Like when someone starts typing, you see something like Don has started typing. That's an event that gets fired. Every time someone starts typing, you have that event. And then you would write code to respond to those events and uh, act accordingly. You can also connect to Slack using XMPP or IRC. So they really wanted to make it support things that people were already using. Um, so you can actually connect to Slack using a regular IRC client if that's what you'd like to use. So what I'm gonna do is just kind of cover a couple options because bots, we're gonna talk most about bots, but there are a few options. Not everything needs to be a bot. And when you're building something on Slack, it's important to kind of think like, do I want a bot or do I just want a thing that people can just do something like slash Uber order me a ride. Um, and so these are the kinds of options. There are inbound webhooks, outbound webhooks, slash commands, and slack bots. And we'll look at each of these in depth here. So inbound webhooks, um, you go into the UI, and we'll go look at this inside um, Slack in a second, and you tell it, you actually go to apps and integrations, create new inbound webhook, and it'll give you this really long URL. That URL is essentially a secret. You need to keep that um, secure and private. And you're gonna take that URL and you can either use it in your own applications, um, so you can just send a post to it, so a HTTP post, with a payload, uh, and the payloads are in the API <coughs> documentation, or you can take that URL and go put it in other services that already support it. So, for example, in GitHub, you can go to a repo, go into the outbound webhooks of GitHub, take this inbound webhook from Slack and just paste it into GitHub. Now, anytime someone does a pull request or a commit, GitHub is gonna just send a post to Slack, that post gets converted into a message, and it shows up inside of the channel. So let's go ahead and just take a look at where that is real quick. So you can actually get to these things uh, from within your Slack by going to apps and integrations. And then you get taken to their app directory. So these are all the things that people have already built on Slack. And then you would go to build your own. And you have two options. So you can build an app for other Slack teams or you can build something just for yourself. Um, building something for other teams we will get into at the end. It involves having to set up OAuth, getting other companies to uh, basically authorize that your app is gonna be allowed to have access to their Slack and so forth. Um, but the ones that we're gonna build today are gonna be custom integrations just for my team. And then here you have those options. Incoming webhooks, uh, bots, slash commands, and outgoing webhooks. So the incoming webhooks, if we click into here, you can't really see the forms very well, but here's one. So you choose which channel you want it to go into and hit go, and it just gives us this URL. So now we take this URL, go stick that in GitHub, or uh, I could use curl right now and just do a post to it, and it would show up inside of um, Slack. So, and this is an example of what that payload needs to look like. It just needs to include the word, uh, the key text with the value of whatever message you want. There are a whole bunch of things in this documentation for if you want to display uh, links where they automatically show the, uh, you know, they pull the images and the rich uh, media from the page. Uh, or if you have generated like a, a meme image and you want to have that display, how to insert an image instead of just the URL as well. So this is essentially what would happen if we ran this. We would get testing, this is a line of text. Um, and then here's, they actually go, they do a really good job of having documentation inside of where you set the stuff up. So here we can write one that actually sends in a link. Um, you can customize the appearance of it, and then you can actually have it sent to a different channel. Uh, so here's an entire, I believe, if we take this guy, run that, there we go. So we get, this is posted to RenoBots, comes from a bot. Named Whoop -a um, And then the name and the icon, the avatar, all that stuff is customizable by you as well. Um, so if you gave that to GitHub, GitHub would put their avatar in there and probably call it GitHub Bot or something like that. So no code required there unless you wanted to support these in your own application. Any questions so far? Incoming webhooks? 
Cool. So outbound webhooks are the other way around. Uh, something happens in Slack. So someone mentions at Colin Loretz, I want it to send a message to my server, and I'm going to tell it which endpoint to hit. Um, this would be um, for mentions, notifications, <laughs> alerts, things like that. Uh, I believe this is how, like, if this, then that is using um, Git, uh, Slack integration, so that when something happens, send it to us, and then we'll process it and send it to whatever other apps that you care about. Um, again, these are all in the same UI. Back here. And all of these kind of build on themselves. So in this one, I'm going to go ahead and add a new outgoing webhook. And this is what it looks like when it gets sent out. So you get a token. You need that token to, be able to uh, act inside of Slack. Um, so that might be to send a reply. Uh, tells you what channel it came from, when it happened, which user uh, made that. Uh, made the message that triggered it, um, and then you have what text it was, so what is the airspeed velocity of an un unladen swallow, and then you have the trigger word, which was Google Bot. And so in this case, this was uh, used before bots were really introduced, so that you could essentially do like, weather bot, what's the temperature in 89519. Uh, the trigger word would be there so that your code knows which function to run, and you would essentially define a bunch of functions that know how to then respond and post back. Uh, so responding, you do the same thing that we did before. You have a payload that has text. You can have look at the formatting to do uh, parsing and link names. And then you get to then uh, do some more things like which channel should show up in, what's the uh, trigger word and all that stuff. So this is where we would actually define it. So anytime someone says JavaScript send message to, Uh, and then you would probably want to set up some routes for this. So this might be like uh, select trigger. We're not actually going to build this one. So um, that is basically what happens there. You can this one since it's happening the other way around. You define the name and the image all right here, so you don't have to worry about that. Good question. Mm -hmm. Do uh, can the outgoing webhooks be triggered by like a like a different Slack bot from an incoming webhook? Potentially. I think testing that for like, let's see if we get them in an infinite loop. That's not what I was thinking. But like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it should be any, because uh, with the bots, bots are pretty much the same as users. They do have a designation. Um, we'd have to test that. There's probably a way to check. And I'm just thinking of like using like Slack as like a way, like, like a event bus almost, and like mm -hmm. all these different services. Yeah, and the only reason I was thinking about infinite, infinite loops is that I know like Ift can get into an infinite loop pretty easily. Um, and so I'm assuming that they uh, they would allow it to trigger it. Uh, but we can test that after we uh, put this one together. So let's see. So I'll go back here. All right, so we're building up to, um, so back to back up a second. So just like uh, with the outbound one here, your server gets the post from Slack with whatever content it was that triggered it. And then you're going to basically have a whole call and response with the regular web API. You're not using this to go get messages. You're just using it to, to post replies. Uh, and then that way, you can have this back and forth as much as you need. These are stateless, though. So if you want the bot to understand what's going on, you need to be able to store it in a data store or something like Redis or something to keep it around for as long as you need. If you're, uh, there's a lot of survey bots that have been made for things like what does everyone in the office want for lunch today, like that stuff you don't need to keep around forever, but that way you can have all these responses uh, and then have them around so that the bot knows which questions have already been answered by which users. So the next one is a slash command. So this is very, very similar to an outgoing, uh, outbound webhook. Um, the difference is that it's triggered by a slash command inside of Slack. So <coughs> slash weather space, and then you define whatever that text is. That text is going to get sent to you in plain text, and you'll be responsible for doing regexes and things on it to understand what it is doing. Um, this is where a lot of people are using like the uh, natural language processing libraries out there to try to understand what's going on. Uh, we were at a hackathon a few weeks ago where there's one called API.ai, uh, where you essentially build up 
this large dictionary of intents, and then you can match strings to what you're actually trying to trigger. So in this case, it's very simple. If someone were to type in weather and then put a whole bunch of text in there and then Reno, Nevada, I won't know to, to convert that. In this case, this, cur this code on my server is just gonna be expecting a zip code. Let's send that off to like the weather underground API, grab the weather and then respond just like we would have normally. Um, and this is really cool because you can build out all kinds of things like slash weather help, which then will respond with all the options that you can actually send it, uh, slash weather, um, you know, look, I don't know if Slack doesn't just expose your like location, um, but we actually have one of these set up for the Arena Collective here. So the front doors, um, this is actually a bot called doors. Um, but this response came through because I have a slash command called doors, um, slash doors list actually lists the three doors and then what state they're in, unlocked, locked. Uh, and then eventually the goal is that you'd be able to do slash doors set, I think it's set schedule to meet up. The schedule you were trying to set is not valid. So there, I've added a bunch of things in here to do that. I don't have a help on this one, so I don't actually remember what the command was. Uh, but that's basically what you can do there. I have one uh, in another Slack channel. So this one is, uh, you guys can see that. So this one is slash numerous. Um, so numerous is just a, an API that lets you get and set numbers. So set coffee counter to five. Um, you do get to give it like this kind of uh, helper text, but it only lets you support one. So that one should probably be like, like type help or more options. Uh, and then you can give it a name or the set value of a number. Um, and then you can go through and do, um, this one I've made a long time ago and it doesn't seem to be working, but like what is the Truckee River Discharge? This one's supposed to go check um, numerous for that specific value in numerous and it's not working for whatever reason, but uh, we will show some of the work in a second. When you do the slash commands, does everybody in the channel see it or just do it? So you have the option of, of responding so that only you see it or so that everyone sees it. Uh, so that's super helpful, like slash help. Probably you don't want everyone in the Slack channel seeing it. Um, in this case, Slack bots the one responding to me, so you don't end up, uh, and you can say, it says only you can see this message after it, which you, can, you can't see very well, uh, right there. Um, so you do get to set that. And, uh, what you'll notice is that you'll actually be able to use, a lot of people are using slash commands to access the bot. Because the bot, um, this is getting ahead, but the bot actually sits in your channel as a user and you can talk to it directly, send it messages and things. In this case, I don't have a doors user or I don't have a numerous user just sitting in there. Um, so that's really up to you to decide, like, do I need a full presence user in the room uh, at all times or do I just want it to be a slash command uh, the bots are really interesting though because they're using the real-time API, which is the next one that we're going to look at. So with the real-time API, uh, your server has to initiate uh, a connection with Slack. So it's using WebSockets so that once you're connected, you have to stay connected to receive messages. Once you disconnect, you have to reconnect. And so there's a little bit of things here where you have to think about how you build this, uh, especially when you start thinking about building out a business on top of this where all these bots are actively listening to all of these channels. Um, you're actually listening to orgs, not to channels. Um, I'm sorry, listening to what? You're listening to the, the Slack org, the company itself. Okay. So you, you're not gonna like attach yourself to each individual channel and have 10 connections, you'll have one. Um, but you'll still have one per company. So every company that OAuths with you, you will be connected to them. Uh, once you've initialized, then you have this back and forth handshake of every single event that you want to watch. You don't have to watch them all. Uh, you can then uh, listen to them. There are some people who have built, uh, it's a little bit more feasible for uh, slash commands and incoming and outgoing webhooks to use um, to use Lambda, 
because Lambda can be, uh, so Lambda is on, on AWS. Uh, it allows you to write a line of code. Right now it's Python, PHP, and Java, uh, but they're gonna support other JavaScript. JavaScript. Java is important too. I think PHP is not. I just think that makes sense. Uh, but uh, you can use the Amazon API gateway to create an endpoint. That endpoint can then point to a Lambda function, and you actually have what's really a really really inexpensive solution. If you then want to, you can use something like Dynamo or uh, any of their other database options. If you wanted to use Redis, you would have to spin up a whole instance, put Redis on it, or use one of those Redis services. So using the kind of pay-as-you-go services for the other kinds of commands is super simple. With this one, you have to keep that connection open, so you can't use Lambda for that. Uh, you can do it on Heroku, but it, you'll have to keep in mind you can't do a free one on Heroku because it can only stay alive for, I think, it's 18 hours before it has to go to sleep for six hours and then come back online. Uh, so we're not going to, that's as much as we're going to cover about the infrastructure about running these. Uh, the bot that I have, we're going to run on my machine uh, just to show you an example of it. Uh, but once you're in there, now this whole side of things, this is your bot. So it's all of the parts that you're going to write that are going to connect to that WebSocket and then communicate back and forth. So to talk about it, just a couple examples, this is uh, one called Birdly. This is a bot, I think they were part of the Slack fund. Uh, where you can't see it, but it was basically, uh, you actually talk to uh, Bill Birdly, which is the little bot sitting in there, and you say, who is Ron Martin? And this bot goes out to Salesforce, Zendesk, Stripe, Intercom, and pulls up Ron Martin's accounts in all those systems. Um, so it's making four API calls, goes and grabs those things, and then returns them all here with links to View and Intercom, View and Stripe, View and Zendesk. Um, so pretty novel example there. Um, this one's called StatSpot. Um, it allows you to do things like new users this week. It goes and pulls that from the Google Analytics API, puts it into a graph, and then drops it in there for you with, with comparisons to the previous week. Um, and it has a whole bunch of support for tags like um, new users, page views, all those kinds of things. Um, the other examples that are real in the store are things like the Uber one. Uh, lots of monitoring tools, things like uh, Nagios and PagerDuty and all the tools that we use to send ourselves messages, you can just send it to a channel. Um, we also, for numerous, we get, uh, we have a channel called Reviews. This is using, uh, I believe this is using inbound webhooks, so every time a new review happens on our app, in the App Store, we get a, a message that goes to the whole team. Um, very, very cool way of just being able to like see progress as things happen. Um, but I'm going to pop over here. So uh, in my Slack, we have uh, there's a few things that are interesting about bots. So bots can't make themselves join a channel, and this is good. They have to be invited to the channel by a real person. Um, so in this case, I actually have two bots sitting in the channel here. One is called IMHO, and one's called Tron. And then Pete's a real person, and there's Slack bot. Um, there should be another one in here which is called, let's see. There's another one called subcurrent. So subcurrent is, you actually notice this here. So subcurrent is green, Slackbot's green, and these two are white. Um, that's because those two aren't actually online and connected to the uh, WebSocket. Subcurrent is a polling um, bot that's made by subcurrent. And I just have this in here to show you guys. We'll actually invite subcurrent to this channel. Can everyone see that back there? So now subcurrent joined, and now I have the ability to do, this is an example of mixing slash commands with a, uh, with a bot. So I can do poll, and we can just copy their example, which is better, uh, tacos or pizza. And what they do is they then give us a link uh, that is valid for four hours. So this is just their way of doing it again you can do whatever you can code. So this is just how they did it. I've seen a few other polling, there's, there's a lot of polling Slack bots um, where it actually goes back and forth with you and asks you all these questions. The issue in building that is that you have to maintain the state of all that back and forth conversation, know when the conversation is done. And what this will do is, uh, there's some that will then go out and message every user that's in your Slack or every user that's in a certain channel. 
And you have a full reign of the API to do that. You can say, invite all five people that are in the RenoBots channel, uh, just send them a message and ask them when they can meet. And the bot will click all the responses and say, these are all the things, like, this is the best time to meet. Um, but if I click on this link, this is just taking us, they pulled in what channel I'm in, they pulled in my question, but they didn't grab my answers. So let's do tacos or pizza. You didn't format it their way. Yeah. You forgot the quotes. And then they have some premium features. So this is something that they want people to build businesses on top of Slack. So they are encouraging people to make premium bots. This one's free with premium features. Um, I don't know what the pricing is like. In this case, this one just posts straight to the channel that it was in. Uh, but I have seen ones that go out to each individual user so that not everyone has to see this and then just report back to the person who started it. Um, but the way that they're still allowing people to vote is with the emoji support. So you press one for the first option, two for the other option. That's and awesome. if I choose one, you should see that now tacos is winning and pizza has 0%. If I do one over here, I can actually vote twice. Now they're 50 50. Do this one again. Now is that doing a new message each time, or is it updating? So itself? it's it, so you can it's updating the same message. So you can use the I believe it's the message ID, or you can it's the same message ID. So it's replacing it in line, um, and then now you have Colin use slash poll vote using the emoji gifts, and then you can view the results in the browser. Quick question: mm -hmm. if, if I really like tacos, I mean, can you double poll? Nope. No. So okay. if I double tap this, it's just going to toggle it and freak out a little bit, but there it goes. Yeah. Interesting. See what happens if we add another. So it has some integrity in terms of spot. But yeah, so that's just a good example of subcurrent. So let's take a look at what it takes to build one. Um, okay, so this is the simplest line. These are just a couple lines of code just to connect to it. Um, this is using, uh, so there, there is a client library for pretty much every language you can think of. Uh, you can get to that through the uh, API docs. Um, and so in Node, what I'm doing is creating, um, just requiring the Slack client. Can you raise it Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Cool. Um, so we're creating the client, and then in this case, you know, all these libraries are going to be a little bit different. There's a couple Node ones. This one, um, you need to go define, uh, grab these events out of the client here. So in this case, I only want the real-time uh, messaging events. Uh, this is my token. Let me just shorten this. I'm going to be deleting this later, so don't memorize it. I dare you to memorize it. Uh, we go ahead and define a new client with our token, and then I'll keep the log level to debug, and you'll see what that looks like in a second. And then we just start it. Uh, because we have this token, this token, I guess I'm ahead of myself, you actually create in here. So let's go into bots. So I would create a new bot. Let's do dev bot, add bot integration. And this is where you get that token. So uh, that's given to you. You can customize the name, give it a picture or an emoji. Thumbs up emoji. Give it a name. What does the bot do so that people see it? And the bot's currently in, in no channels, and you can't add it to a channel from here. Okay. Uh, this is just if you go into modify, and you can see which channels it's already in. We'll save that one. And in this case, this is actually important to see. So uh, if you are on free Slack, bots count as integrations. And on a free plan, you only get two, I believe. Um, so I already have two defined. <coughs> So we'll go ahead and go to figure, custom integrations, and here we have the, the couple that I already have. So DevBot's here. They let me create it, even though I'm at my limit, so maybe three is the limit, but here are the other two that I have. So the one that the code that we're looking at right now is for Tron. So there's Tron's API token, and there's the API token. So if we go ahead and just start this, you'll see here that we're actually outputting in the terminal all of these events. This is going to be really hard for everyone to see because there's a lot of them. Um, 
once it's connected, it does this ping pong over and over again, just these private messages to check if it's active or not. Um, and it just keeps going forever. This is because the, debugs, the debug is set to, uh, the log level is set to debug. Uh, and then they give you like a reconnect URL so that you don't have to go do the whole handshake again. Um, there are a whole bunch of tools that have been made so that you don't have to worry about initializing and handling all the handshakes and all that stuff. Um, so this is the simplest way to connect to it. And then once you're connected, you would do uh, on events. So rtm.on new message, new user, new channel, things like that. Um, so let me show an example. So this is using the Slack client, um, the, node, the official node Slack client and their official library doing it all by hand. Um, there's a company called Howdy that is probably the more well-known bot company um, behind um, Slack. And they came out with something called BotKit. BotKit is amazingly simple to use. Uh, even if you've not used Node before, I would check it out. I don't know if there's, uh, I believe it's only Node for BotKit, um, but there are other people making things for Ruby and other languages as well. Um, and so what this is gonna do, uh, we can ignore this for now. So var config is just my config file, so there's my Slack token and my meetup token. We're gonna use the meetup API in a second. And we just have to uh, create a new controller for our bot and then spawn it. So this handles the initial connection to uh, the WebSocket, use our token, and then we'll go ahead and start. So we actually haven't connected yet. So what we've done is once we actually define that bot, you'll see it as a way over here. So here's devbot, here's IMHO, and here's Tron. We'll start listening, and then we can start to do controller.here. So it's very similar to the dot on that you normally would see in an event-based. Um, if you've used WebSockets before, it's pretty common. Um, but what they've done is they really wrapped and made it just really easy to use. So you can just focus on what the bot does, not on how do I write a bot, and then how what I want it to do. Um, so in this case, controller.here is identify yourself only if it's a direct mention. So I have to do at Tron, identify yourself, in order for it to respond to this one. Uh, it gives you information about the bot. It gives you uh, the message that was sent to it so that you can reply to that message. And then bot.reply accepts the message so they can reply to it and then your message. Uh, in this case, I'm just sending it a string. And then I have another one down here, which is another controller.here is when is the next meetup. Uh, this one will work if you send the bot a direct message, so no one else will see it, um, and it'll respond just in band to you. Uh, direct mention, which is the at Tron, anywhere it's at in, inside of Slack. Uh, mention is if you just say Tron without the at sign. And then ambient is just if someone says, when is the next meetup? So if someone's in Slack, they can just do that. They don't have to even know Tron exists, and it will trigger this one. Uh, so what I'm going to do, and then ignore this little object down here, but I'm going to go ahead and just start it as is. And once that's started and you pop over to Slack, you'll actually see that Tron is now online. And if we say identify yourself, nothing should happen. Tron, identify yourself. Ah, so in this case, Tron's not in the room yet, so we have to invite Tron first. And the bots, they'll automatically uh, join if you invite them. So now we can do that. So that one went ahead and responded. Now I can say, when is the next meetup? And then Tron will say, okay, let me check on that. So there's no coding here to do the check-in yet. I have that in a second, which we'll look at. Uh, but at that point, any of those rules that we have for formatting text, links, images, whatever you want, um, you can do here. So if you want to go out and talk to the Uber API or the car and then say, okay, the car will be here in four minutes. Um, something like that, you have to teach it where you are. So you either need some kind of way of configuring it with an address, uh, maybe even a conversational way of doing that would be 
I don't know what your address is, where are you located, or where would you like to be picked up, and then you would just put in the address. Um, that one you'd have to then also make sure that it's a real address and you're not sending a car somewhere far away or something. Um, so I guess what we'll do next is grab this code down here. And once this bot, uh, after tonight, we'll actually add this bot to the dev reno in Slack. Um, so what this is going to do um, is we're using the meetup uh, API to get all the meetups that I belong to and then find out what the next one is uh, and then only check them if they're one of these four and then if it's after right now. So um, we're not going to need to go into the details of all that. But what happens here is if there is another event, um, we need to take their weird time meetups uh, timestamp and put it into PST, which will break at daily savings time again. <laughs> And then the next meetup is next event on name on the date, check it out at the URL, or sorry, I don't see any upcoming meetups in Reno. So let's move all this up here. And restart the bot. Meetup is still happening, so there's the new meetup. Um, so, again, for the most people in most situations, you're going to end up building something for yourself using that API key, and you're good. Um, if you go this other route, you're going to build pretty much everything the same way, it's just that you have to keep track of multiple tokens. You're probably going to have some way of storing who, you know, have a user table of your customers that are using your service and store their um, token with them so that ideally you have a plan or something like that in the future. Um, and so in here, there's also something called the Slack button, which allows you to just say, add this bot to your Slack. And that starts the whole OAuth process. Once they've accepted it, then that bot gets added to your org. Then you have that bot that you can invite to whatever channels you want. I believe when they first came out, they just joined all the channels, or it was just like you could just put them in whatever channel. I think there was an issue around, and I think anyone, anyone who has an admin privilege in the org can add a bot. And some bots, I don't yet know if bots are allowed to do things that Slack already does. So there's some things there you want to check and see what does Slack already do? Probably don't build a bot that does that. Um, but I mean, if some people really love like Skype, for instance, you can start a Skype call from within Slack. Slack is adding video chat directly into Slack, so you really won't need it. Um, it's probably going to be a pro feature. Uh, and then there's also some other things like, I don't believe you can record channel history and store it. That's also something that Slack charges for for paid plans. So, I mean, it'd be really easy to just listen and just record everything that's happening and then give people their archives. Um, that's probably not something that they want to be doing. Um, let me pull up Audi.ai. Um, so this is that company that creates BotKit. Um, they, what's also really interesting about building these is that it's, it's not technically hard. It gets really interesting thinking about what am I going to ask the user, what is the user saying to me, and the hardest part is actually probably registering the response, like what is this, and then being able to get to what is, and then the keywords, what if there's more than one keyword, there's a whole bunch of things there um, that you want to think about. Um, in this case, they have some examples of like collect lunch orders, automated meetings, um, the whole idea of like when can everyone meet is a really great idea for a bot. Um, so rather than sending out an email, figuring out when everyone can meet. Uh, if you wanted, you could even connect it to Google Calendar, not even ask people when they can meet. Just go check all their calendars to see when they can meet and create that event and say, okay, I scheduled this. Um, I know there's a bot that will schedule hotels and uh, flights for you, so like all of that requires your card to be on file somewhere. Uh, hopefully not in my list somewhere. But, um, yeah, so just think about it. The wording of, it's a lot of it's like writing uh, Choose Your Own Adventure. It's, if you've ever you played MUDs or Moves or things like that back, you know, 
those were games where you had bots that you were interacting with all the time. Uh, same goes for aim bots. I mean, none of these things are new either. Hip Chat, Campfire, they've all had bots, IRC bots, things like that too. So, um, Hubebot is a project from uh, GitHub. It supports uh, Hip Chat, Slack, um, Campfire, all those things. It's very powerful. This is the, what we had built Tron on uh, originally. So we used to use Tron as our bot for, we would just teach it to do tricks anytime we were bored. We would just like, let's play chess with Tron. And it would just put out a chess board and ask you every time you played with it. Um, so there's really no shortage of things you can do. There's also, I think Hubot has a huge collection of scripts that you can actually import. Um, that you don't even have to worry about writing them yourself. So if you go to scripts, yeah, it looks like they're all in NPM now. Um, but again, you do have to host these things. Um, so think about that if you're gonna do it. The slash commands and the incoming and outgoing, uh, inc incoming and outgoing webhooks are really nice because they don't require a lot of infrastructure, so you can do these one-off, you know, even the weather example, the unlock the doors example can all be done without a bot. Um, but if you're gonna have a bot, it's kinda gonna be always on. Uh, or you could potentially make a slash command that tells it to turn on and turn off, things like that if you're using Heroku or something. So, um, API.ai, this is a service I would look into. Um, we used it very briefly at a hackathon, um, but it's very powerful for being able to define uh, phrases and then tag those phrases to intense. So set the temperature to 65, it would parse that and start to learn, and you can teach it all the different possible phrases, like um, make the room 65, all these different phrases, and it would understand what 65 is, degrees, things like that. So then you could do a, like a nest API integration with that, things like that as well. Um, and yeah. the punctuation you can do in Slack, like, you know, and bold, is that the challenge too? No, so um, as long as you can do it here in Slack, so like bold would be, um, Asterix, it's probably hard to see. But so if you parse that those responses, you have to worry about that too, right? Because there's an asterisk for the No, they strip that out. They strip that yeah, I'm pretty sure they strip that out. You have to send it back if you want it to bold. So like this one I bolded the name of the meetup that was coming. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure ninety percent sure they strip that yeah. out. And for the most part, when you're talking to the bot, you're probably not gonna do like italics and bold and things like that. Because it's a Because you're not. You picked it up if you didn't know you were yeah. talking about it. Yeah, if it's silent, well, we'd have to check on that, but I, I think they stripped that out. Um, most of those commands, I think they're they're marked down like syntax. That's like kind of the formal part of it, so what questions does everybody have? So for. Um, for kind of, for three, four, can you re, can you restrict channels to be botless so that information doesn't flow out? And can you can you track and revoke bots in a centralized place? Yes. So they they'll show up under apps and integrations, um, no matter who installed them. I uh, don't know if you can necessarily restrict the bot, like this is a bot free zone type thing. I don't know if you can do that. That would be interesting to see. So the bots each have their own tokens and they can't be affected by the company. So that's where I'm also curious to see if a bot can trigger another bot. It should be able to. It just shouldn't be able to tell it to like kick a bot out of a room. Because you can, I mean, as a user, I can do things like leave, um, don't believe. Yeah, so you can do kick or remove. So if I remove the key from this channel, so you can't remove this member. It's probably not going to be allowed to do things like that. Um, there are a lot of you know, things in here in the documentation to read through. Um, you know, each one of these APIs has a whole bunch of methods. Um, there's something called unfurling links um, that if you send it in like a YouTube, it will actually automatically pull in the YouTube um, embed and things like that. Um, but then you can also go in and so you can make your own services that know how to unfurl automatically. So you know that if I post in a link and I always want the fourth picture to show up in Slack, then you can teach it. Like that, so.
questions about bots in general. Someone, I, I didn't read the post about how to make a <laughs> non-racist bot, but. Well, there's, there's a nice article. Um, I don't know if you, uh, if you how much she caught, but uh, last week Microsoft uh, put an uh, AI-based uh, Twitter bot online and had it responding to people. And uh, you know, it was uh, built on some heavy-duty neural network technology that they're experimenting with. And they'd even done, apparently they'd done a prototype in China and had great results. And, and, but uh, of course, uh, parts of Twitter can be a very toxic environment. And they didn't. They didn't account for uh, all the all the ways it could be influenced. Uh, so within a couple of days, it was uh, spouting uh, racist uh, remarks, uh, making referrals to Hitler, and um, they they took it offline and, and apologized. He was like, yeah, it's like wow. that's the mm -hmm. oh, okay. Probably like two minutes. Is that gone? Is that gone? Yeah. Oh, and so that, that's something to think about when you're building a bot. If you're backing it with IBM Watson or something, yeah. Watson can learn bad things. Yeah, and of course this isn't the first bot to to, to be on Twitter, and the first uh, bot that could, you know, they, they, they could do interesting things. And and so there was an article, I think it was in Vice, uh, that that uh, they talked to some other bot creators who had who had addressed some of these issues. And uh, there's even NPM libraries to. Uh, f uh, filter words so that uh, you can try to build something. Uh, as as one guy put it, uh, I want to build something that it, that I wouldn't be. It says things that I wouldn't be afraid to say to someone in person. Right. And uh, so if, if you're looking for something for entertainment to, to release to a wider audience, or just to keep HR happy, uh, considering these things, considering what pe how people can influence uh, your, your more advanced creations is is important. And if, you, if anyone's played with like the Amazon Echo, you can try, but it, it knows what you're trying to do, and it makes a fun remark back. Just like, I won't repeat that, or things like that too. So you can have some fun with it in your responses too. <laughs> Are there any libraries out there that let you just put a general concept out that you want to listen to, and it kind of extrapolates different possible variations of that, or you kind of like them as far as figuring out how to regex and interpret? Something like the API.ai is going to be this one. There's another one called Wit.ai. Those are similar to that. So you kind of you have to. The best way to think of it is that you define. Maybe you have five things this bot does. You would define this five intents, and you would train it a whole bunch of different things. But you would also allow it to self-train because they would basically then you go back to it every week. And it's like these people sent all these things to it. And you can say yes, that one, that one, that one. No, that's not, you know, next Monday, it wasn't March something, it was April something, so they missed the tag for the date. Um, what's really cool about this and WIT is that they both have um, data types like temperature and date time, so you can say, like, remind me tomorrow without having to put in the actual date, uh, things like that. And I, the one thing I did get, like you saw when I did the, just this quick date conversion is, like, when you have a server running out in one place, like, Time, like I'm assuming that there's a way to get the locale of each user, because if they ask you something about tomorrow, their tomorrow may not be the same tomorrow for people in America if they're in, you know, across the date line too. So, lots of stuff to think about. Um, but this one, I think it's pretty reasonably priced too. And we, I mean, this one was the easiest to get to using it, and you actually have a button. They support voice too, which won't work in Slack, but. Uh, you can test it as you're building it and just, like say out loud, like set temperature to 65 and it will show you which ones it's highlighted and all that. The regex is there's some good libraries for some of that out there too. Uh, or it'll force you to get good at regex mm -hmm. and things. Yeah. That was my weakness for sure. How easy is it to get the Slack bot to send emails for you? Because I've used the reminder control the whole time and you might expect to send emails. Yeah, so for that one, you would have a server that has something like SendGrid or uh, Postmark, one of those email companies, and you could trigger it the same way. You would have to then teach it, like, how would, how do you get the subject line versus the two versus, like, send an email to email address. Okay, what's the subject line? Okay, what's the body? You could totally do that. That would be kind of interesting. Um, there's no undos on that one, but <laughs> once it's sent, that would be kind of cool.
Is there a test environment or? There's, I mean, you can create as many slacks as you want. So okay. yeah, you can create your own. Um, I have one too many slacks. Is there like, is there like a limit? Have you reached the limit yet for like the number of slacks you want? I don't know that there's an, a limit here. So what, what's also interesting, this is just a slack thing. Like some of these I'm only in for like one channel because they're a client or something. Uh, and they're coming out with shared channels so that instead of me belonging to yet a whole other login, I can actually just have that shared channel show up in my Slack. So I'm hoping to get down to like three instead of this many. But, uh, then that'll be interesting because they're just channel IDs. I don't know how the, the, the concept of the auth tokens and things are gonna change. Like, can a bot belong to a shared channel? Probably not because whose channel is it? Is it or maybe it can and one of the companies is paying for it. Right? That, that's interesting. That's probably why we don't have them yet. Um, I can't speak for Slack, so I'm looking at you, Kim. <laughs> All the cameras. Cool. Awesome. Hopefully that was helpful. Yeah. Do you have any more topics? Cool. Not until next month. Okay. Finishing earlier then. You want to see if you can get the. Do you have, do you have two bots you can connect that thing and see if it'll pick up its own? Yeah, we can do that. Let's see the, the outgoing hooks for the one. Well, I'm just curious if you had, you yeah, had let's one see that. set so to like an ambient. It would yeah, let's see. What is the next meetup? So you could just curl into the. The one thing that is annoying is that these menus change, so like getting back to your boss changes. Like I know I have some. Oh, that's because I'm in. Let's do an outgoing webhook when someone mentions meetup. In any channel, meetup. And then we need to actually send it to a real place. What? Hmm? All right, so request bin is a site that you can create a URL that you can just send test posts to. Um, so I'm going to take this URL and put it, we're like gluing the internet together. Right? Exactly. Um, put that in there. Here's our token. So if this works, then we'll, we'll get something in our request bin. Save that. Your team has reached the limit, so this might not work at all. That's just always showing up though. Yeah, let me delete one of these other bots. We start first. Delete. Okay, so now we just have Tron and that other one. So when Tron speaks, make sure that they say meet up. So I say when is the next meetup, and then it says when the next meetup is. So that should actually fire twice. said something and then now it's check here. Not reading anything. Did it not actually create it? Thanks. 
Because even I should So it looks like it's trying to match. It's not checking for any mention. Is there a for exactly like what? Yeah, what would get the like? So the trigger word was meet up, and the text was meet up. Do you have to put like a star or something? When a line starts with one of those <coughs> words, optional if a child's choose a channel is. When? So just a win instead of, you know, they'll have a catch yours, they'll kind of catch the ball. <coughs> right. So, oh, the first one in the box. <laughs> the next meetup. How many other people try to hit up to get the last thing you said? <laughs> I think you can do like alt up or something. Alt up? Nope. There is a way to do it. Because up will edit your last one. Okay, so we said that. Let's see if it popped in here yet. Yeah, so it looks like a bot can trigger another bot. Yeah. yeah, so then you'll get this body back and then you can do what you want with it. Um, it's pretty simple. I know like you asked what language we were talking about, but like all of this is just HTTP stuff, so if you can respond to get some posts, then you're good to go. That request the bidding is magic. It is. It's not always online either. I get it. it sometimes dies from too many requests or something. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so if you're building something and you, there's another one that they released called Local Tunnel. So it actually uh, pokes a hole onto the web and puts your local host on the web. Um, so it tunnels into your local yeah. host. But um, yeah, I like it. Cool. Yeah, does anybody have any ideas for bots? Personal assistant bot. Personal assistant bot. Fixed on AI lock? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so some of them, if we go to brilliant bots here, they have like a legal assistant bot. Some of these I'm not sure. These ones are all smart bots that don't have a person behind them. I think the legal assistant one has some kind of legal service behind it. So you would ask the lawyer bot a question and they'd be like, oh, we'll get back to you. And then you get charged for legal services a little bit later. Um, Roba is something about capturing and celebrating team wins, so it's like a celebration bot. Um, Salesforce. There's not surprisingly a Salesforce one here yet. New to do's, lucid charts, chat, video, air table. Uh, there, so there are a lot of companies that have added integrations to Slack, and they have very, very low, like, they don't do a lot. Uh, they just did it so they can say that they support Slack, I think. Slash done. <laughs> I like the description of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Nestor. So Nestor is actually kind of cool. If you, uh, I should have probably showed you guys this one before. Uh, Nestor actually hosts your bot for you. Um, so they give you like a web ID and it has a bunch of integrations already built into it. So uh, you're writing this code, but you don't have to write all the rest of the code. It just is the response code. Um, and then they have uh, integrations that automatically, like you don't have to know how to use the Roku API or the Trello API. They're just adding all these little integrations to it. I think you pay to have them post to your bot. Um, but you can also just use, it looks like it's using the Qbot API, so you can just go post it somewhere else if you wanted to. Um, again, there's a lot of different clients for each language, so they're not all gonna be the same. Um, the one that I found, Botkit, was the easiest one to use. Um, the other one was like, you had to override all the functions that you wanted to use, and it was just hard to read, so. Cool. Can you show us one done by a company? 
Yeah, like, so that you know what it dips in a little more. Yeah. That you just so the so the pulling one is one that was done by a company that's pretty simple. So let's just go and find one. We can add just add more bonds to your slack. Yeah. Maybe a tape bond. Let's add it to the collective slack. <laughs> <laughs> let's add it to the Debrina slack, because I don't know. Um, okay, so let's do the weird thing is a lot of these require you to have an account with the company that you're going to integrate with. So okay. Let's find one that I have. Actually, this one's already in there. Let's do slash Foursquare. In, in a related question, did they help you administer an account? Because you'd want a revenue stream. Or do you know? Um, no, you have to create like user accounts in your own database somewhere. Okay. Uh, and then you would still have to build like a payment plan and all that. Like they don't do payments as far as I know. Okay. Um, you have to have your own subscription service to do the billing. And I think that's another thing to think about is like there's a fund for this, but to be honest, like uh, we don't yet know if bots are something we want to pay for. It. You're already if you pay for premium Slack, you're paying nine dollars a user per month. What are you charging? Is it going to be a dollar a user per month on top of that? Is it a certain number per bot? What is your kind of like, if the bot gets heavy use, is it by user, by channel, by command, whatever it is? Uh, and I don't think there's a whole lot of known there yet. If it's something that saves you a lot of time, then it might be worth that extra dollar. What if all the users aren't using it? I don't think you can just say only five users are using it. The others can't use it. I don't believe that that's I mean, built into you that. You could configure your bot to only respond you can really to certain users. Don't, yeah, you're not active, Chris. You can't use it. It seems like the I have you know Slack has their service. Everything. I have my service, and then one of the features of the pro version of my service is that there's a Slack integration. Right? right. That seems like the more likely scenario. Yeah. Is that you've already bought into this other service, and now you can integrate it to another tool. So there's another interface. Yeah, so this one's installed. This is just a slash command. It's Foursquare, so I can do, um, if I do Foursquare, it says query in place. So copy in Reno. Those are the Foursquare API. Uh, honestly, a lot of the marketing is around like these bots that have these intelligent conversations with you, but the most useful ones are like just simple commands into other places. Um, lots of connecting. Uh, like we just did, request bin to this server, this server to this webhook, to this webhook, to these other things. Can you cook in, can you do some sort of autocomplete with it? No, that's a limitation. Like if you could teach it an autocomplete of things. But yeah, I mean, that you would have be the nice. documentation there, but. Yeah, you I'm literally a only typist, get. So. Uh, actually, it looks like you can support. You might now be able to support more than one thing, but I remember it used to only let you see this one hint, and if there were like other commands you could do, you'd have to teach it to do help or something. Um, let's see. Yeah, the rest of I mean, most of these aren't going to have a conversation like nest. It's going to be set the nest to a certain temp and it's done. Lift, get a ride. Uh, the other really weird thing is that they don't show like, I know screenshots kind of are dumb, but, but I'd like to see what it does yeah. before I add it. Um, and they don't even link to the company's website. So there's no way to figure out if this is by Lyft or by someone who built it on top of Lyft. This one is. So if you hit help and support, it takes you to Lyft. But yeah, but anybody could link there. Yeah. And then you can report apps. But so I think they're still building it out and figuring out what it can become. Um, there are some interesting ones, like expense reports are kind of interesting, being able to send a bot your receipts, so that you can just automatically have those go into Expensify. Um, again, anything you can build. Uh, I had a hard time coming up with, uh, like I was like, oh, if there's a fund for apps out there, like what could you build that's like Slack first? It's hard pressed to find anything that should be built on Slack and not somewhere else first and then integrated into Slack. So. Racist chatterbox. Anti-racist chatterbots. <laughs> cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
stick around for a little while longer. There's no beer left and possibly some pizza. There's vegetarian pizza. There's vegetarian pizza. So I just wanted um, to announce that, uh, and so let's see Joe here, but we're, Microsoft is hosting the Reno Hackathon co-located with the NASA Space Apps Hackathon the same day. I have flyers. Uh, we have five categories this year, best game, best use of Azure Machine Learning, uh, best Azure app, best Windows, uni universal Windows app platform, and people's choice. Uh, they range from three to five hundred dollars in awards. There's lots of door prizes, free food, and everything. Uh, April 23rd, 24th, noon, noon to noon. It's actually quite a bit of fun, and we do a lot of good stuff. So come talk to me if you want to hear more about it, or just take one of the flyers. that has got an all around. Thank you. April 23rd to 24th, which happens to intersect with my wife's out of town, so that's going to be fun. <laughs> Did you have a hand in setting the dates, or? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> this is different than the Space Apps Challenge? We are, so, we are co we are different, we are co-located, and you can, you can enter joint entries if you want, so. Um, I can speak you know, Space Apps. So yeah, Space Apps cool. is going to be the same weekend, NASA picked the dates, um, the challenges have been released, so if you want to go to the Space Apps page to go read the challenges, um, a lot of heavy VR stuff, which is hard to do on the weekends, uh, a lot of machine learning and things also hard to do on the weekend, but um, we have a couple teams that I know of I would argue that with Azure Machine Learning, actually. And then we so, might build it on yeah. Microsoft and win both prizes. Yeah. So, there's a reason why that's in there. That's good. So the, the challenges seem harder this year than they've ever been, and some of them just, uh, I don't know, if it's that the problems that they have are getting harder, but um, they seem harder in the weekend to do than what we have. Doing a fun event with good codes. If you have questions about what that means, what would be? But yeah, you can recall, so if you want to grab the Space S challenge, and you can do a Space S challenge as a Microsoft Hackathon uh, entry, you just have to massage it, you know. Put it, if you take it and put it on Azure, it qualifies. I'll just leave, leave it there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So it says here on our list that next month is intro to Go Lane. So there's that. Anybody using Go? Is Paul and Neil even working around here? No, I just prefer to establish the mission. I don't know if it goes there. What is it? It's another language. It's a. Yeah, it's a. It was written as a low level language to be better than using C to the first language. And code. And code. You know, it's got a lot of the same. A lot of the same goals behind it, like Rust, uh, right? So, yeah, so you know, get, get, so you, you, uh, well, it, meaning that they both have a, a similar goal, which is you want to be able to write systems stuff, but, but languages have come far enough that we should be managing our own memory, essentially, right? Like, why am I working around with this and having buffer overruns and security goals when I could use a language that prevents that from happening? That's one of the and I know, I know Go has a lot of other, like Go's thing is, still help me with that, Colin, but Go's thing is there's like a, there's a way to write, kind of like got the Python mentality from what I've been able to observe is you write stuff this way in Go, and the uh, compiler can be very, very good. Yeah, I think it is compiled, but yeah, it's got some constraints that are really easy. You just put it on the server. Yeah, it's got some constraints around it to, to make it look really efficient. A lot of people are using it, a lot of the posts that have been coming out are like how we went from some crazy number of servers to two servers. Yeah. I mean, I feel like anything that comes out that's what's out with it. Yeah. We finally optimized our notes from the 1990s. Of course, then you always get someone saying, you know, if you rewrite it the same length, you might have done the same thing. Um, <laughs> I will say that the numerous are APIs or things go, and we have stuff written in so, and like stuff in notes just sometimes dies. Yeah. So sometimes it's a lie, sometimes go. Did that help at all? Yeah. I mean, I have no real cursory knowledge about the ghost.